Well, I'm excited to spend some time talking with uh, Elizabeth McGraw, the director of Penn State's Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics. And uh, welcome, Elizabeth. Look forward to having a conversation with you. Hey, Eric. Nice to be here. So uh, we should start with just helping people understand um, uh, what SEED is and the kind of work that you all do at this critical moment in our human history with the coronas, cor cor coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, so SID is a collection of around 50 faculty who are united by a shared interest in infectious disease. Um, and so we've got people really working across a broad uh, range of disciplines within that niche. So we've got people doing modeling and informing governments and the healthcare industry around best practice. We've got people studying virus in the lab and trying to understand how it's transmitted. And then we have also people working on developing therapeutics, novel therapeutics, and also vaccines. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm really curious, uh, uh, the work that we're doing in this Meal College of Business, uh, as we've talked about previously, is really around how businesses can be a part of the solution to help reduce environmental um, and social harm around the world in their operations and their supply chains and their products and, and, and so forth. Uh, so the kinds of questions I think we'll explore will be a little bit uh, different in a good way uh, from what you've uh, spoken about uh, in, other, uh, in other venues. So my first question is, um, is it my, my understanding is that the prevalence of infectious disease and the spread of, of these uh, zoonotic diseases, and maybe you can explain a little bit what that uh, term refers to, has been increasing over the last, you know, I don't know, decades, 30 years or so. And can you just respond to that? Can you explain, is that, is that the case? And why, if that is the case, why is that? Yeah, I think there's, there's sort of multiple facets that explain that increased uh, rate of these sort of diseases. So when we say a zoonosis, we mean a disease that's really native to animals, but then uh, the word you'll hear is spillover. So it spills mm -hmm. over from um, its natural animal host into humans. And sometimes it spills over and doesn't go very far, right? It might infect one person and we might never even notice it or it might infect a couple of people. Um, but the ones we notice are the big ones that kick off these transmission events then subsequently between humans, like we're seeing right now. And so, you know, the more sort of interaction we have with those animals, the more likely we are to have those events. And those increasing interactions are caused by a lot of things. So anything that's destroying animal habitat starts putting stress on those animal populations. Um, anything bringing humans into uh, contact with that habitat. Um, you know, we've got animals and humans sort of fighting over the, the, the mm. sort of shared spaces um, is, is bound to increase that activity. Um, mm. And then other things really assist with that in the last few decades. The first thing is that we're a really globally connected society. So uh, in the past, if we had one of these sort of small outbreaks, it might not become a pandemic, right? It might not go global. But, you know, when you can fly around the world and you know, 24 hours, it's very easily to rapidly spread these sort of, uh, these sort of pathogens that are coming out of these spillover events. Mm -hmm. So spillovers are probably much more common than we, than we appreciate. Um, and the ones we pay attention to are the big ones that sort of explode like this one has and become really successful at transmitting between humans. To what extent does the trade illegal trade uh, in often cases, as I understand it, of uh, endangered species play a part in that increase? Yeah, so that's, that's a huge component. Um, you know, there's been a lot of controversy. I think you've probably heard in the media in the last few weeks, is this a bat virus? Is it a pangolin virus? Is it a, a virus that spent time in bats and then pangolins? And then has it spent time in humans straight away? Or has mm. it been there, you know, has it just jumped in? Has it been there for a while? And so um, the more contact people are having with, these, with wildlife, it's just every time you have contact, you have these increased frequencies. Um, and also if you've got contact in sort of environments that are stressful for the animals, you know, those are the environments where we see um, viral loads increase. And so a whole range of these factors start compounding. So humans interacting with animals that they normally wouldn't or shouldn't, um, uh, animals being potentially sick or stressed, that allow viral loads to really explode. Um, and then you just end up having more opportunities for these spillover events to happen. And so, you know, I think one of the things we need to do is considering really reducing this contact uh, between humans and wildlife, be it in these circumstances where people are trading animals or where humans are just coming into, you know, the space of animals, you know? Bats are really lovely, amazing creatures, but we shouldn't be interacting with them, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. so I think there's sort of a natural settings we need to manage it, but we also need to really cut down the animal trade. It's been a lot of talk about closing wet markets. 
And, uh, you know, that phrase is not really informative. So, you know, wet markets are also places that sell seafood and chicken and, and basic food for people that people need. And so I think the conversation needs to be more specific and focused on, you know, what are the species that we should not be interacting with? We don't need to shut down places where people buy food. <laughs> what we need to do is make sure that we're limiting our contact with these wild animals who uh, present a particular risk. Is it known uh, whether the SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus, that the reservoir species was a bat and that it was amp the amplifier host, as I understand it, you can refer to it, was a pangolin? That's being talked about. Is that actually known? Yeah, or? I think it's hard, and we might not ever actually know the true history. It's a complicated story. So we know coronaviruses are super common in bats. There are just you know, hundreds of variants of these viruses in them. And so it has definitely come from bat bats. Um, the pangolin angle is harder to sort out. Um, the genome of the virus is complicated, and it looks like it has pieces of virus that look more similar to those that are found in pangolin, and then other pieces that look like the bat. So surely it was of bat origin, but it's also possible that this virus spent time in some other beast. Mm -hmm. And then the other question is, you know, did this virus just recently jump um, from a wild animal into a human, or had it circulated previously? Has it been quietly in human populations for a while and then had a bit of a genetic change that suddenly made it really virulent or capable of spreading between humans? And it's possible that we'll never be able to sort that out, uh, reconstruct that history. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you spoke a little bit about this. I wanna go a little bit deeper into uh, the connection between uh, these kinds of uh, viruses spilling over and. Uh, the changes that uh, we have seen on the environment because of human activity. So in a business context, uh, the changes that often our uh, partners, you know, are a part of would either be the construction of some kind of, you know, facility, some kind of development, you know, operation mm -hmm. uh, activity. Uh, and of course, lots of activity in, is in uh, supply chain, right? And so can you just help us understand a little bit more what is known in the science of the connection between uh, environmental degradation and uh, the rise of these viruses and the spillover effect. Yeah, so I can give you sort of one example that's I think maybe really clear is, uh, and that's the virus called um, Hendra virus. It's found in bats in Australia. Um, and recently it's become problematic because it's getting into horse populations. It kills the horses. Um, and then often people who work closely in association with horses. So trainers and veterinarians. So it sort of does this double spill, right? From a bat to a horse to a human. And, um, and apparently, so there are people at Penn State studying this. We've got a number of faculty in SID who work on this project. And what it looks like is just, you know, the bat feeding grounds are continually getting compressed and compressed. And that's because of development. So, you know, people are flattening landscapes that have um, natural food sources for those bats. And so the bats are having to look further and, and travel more each night to try and find um, their sort of native food sources. And it's bringing them into close association with human settlements. So it's bringing them into pastures near where horses are. And so then you start getting these increased opportunities. Whereas if that bat habitat was still in existence, uh, we would move back in time to a period where, you know, that, that wasn't so common. Um, and so the more development, the more um, land that we're flattening that belongs to these animals and is their natural way to find food, we start altering their behavior and also bringing them into really close contact with humans. And when those, you know, when development, um, you know, intersects with those natural areas. Hmm. And are, are there things that can be done from a, you know, from an urban development uh, standpoint? Uh, you know, so I think about times in the past when I, in earlier lives, when I was a master gardener, uh, when I was working in organic agriculture in Seattle, and we were promoting things like, you know, bat houses and uh, pollinator gardens, or uh, are there sorts of interventions that can be done that uh, ameliorate perhaps the negative impact of development? Yeah, I mean, I think those are very small scale things that people could sure. do at the level of the household. But I think probably um, more powerfully, we need governments to be um, making decisions about what development is allowed or not allowed based on trying to preserve some of these landscapes to really, you know, if for no other reason, really selfishly to try and cut down the interaction between humans and wild animals. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. Yeah, great answer. Okay. Um, is there there's some uh, 
research, as I understand it, coming out of Louisiana. So this is a question about um, uh, any scientific evidence on the impact of the coronavirus and COVID-19 on uh, people of different races, different ethnic groups. Uh, and maybe part of this is also, you know, the socioeconomic uh, status of individuals. What's your understanding of what we actually know from the science in terms of how COVID-19 uh, is uh, transmitted or affects people from different race, ethnic groups, uh, socioeconomic uh, status? Yes, I think the only data we have on this so far is from the US and it's sort of small scale still. So I think uh, there's a bit of caution in interpreting the data and also some data coming out of Chicago and Milwaukee, uh, looking mm. at higher death rates for African-Americans in particular in mm. response to this virus. And so it's too early to tell what that is. So one explanation could be that there's a genetic basis to it. Um, but um, equally likely is that these are populations that are at risk because they may have less access to healthcare. Um, they have probably uh, higher rates of chronic conditions and underlying conditions, um, in part due to that sort of lack of, of you know, access to healthcare. And so uh, groups that are of lower socioeconomic status are at higher risk for this disease. Mm. And I would also say, you know, there's some evidence in the literature that, you know, um, exposure to racism continuously in people's lives increases their inflammation. So it really actually affects their immune system. And so when, if you were to ask me what are all the factors that could be contributing to those differences in death rates, it could be any number of those, uh, those things and probably multiple factors. And so I think it is gonna take time to tease that apart. And as you can imagine, we probably need to look at some of the statistics in communities where um, you know, African-Americans have differing levels of socioeconomic mm. status to try and tease apart how much of it is genetic and how much of it is situational uh, given their circumstance. And with the rapidity with which this has uh, uh, hit our country, hit all countries, uh, do you have a sense whether that data is being collected appropriately so that we will be able to know the answer to that question at some point? Yeah, I think it is. I think our state governments are, you know, um, health labs in particular are keeping, you know, good statistics on all of this. Um, it's just that, you know, epidemiologists right now are sort of, um, you know, pretty focused on trying to manage and flatten the curve and, and uh, you know, the top priorities are to help advise governments on how to manage their hospital beds and ventilators. And, you know, I think that's front, front and center in, in terms of um, where people are putting their efforts. And so I think what we'll find as um, the epidemic wave slows down, there'll be more opportunities to go back and, and learn from this uh, and what was happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So let's transition to uh, those were kind of my, my kind of big picture questions and, and want to ask more uh, specifically now about maybe the role that business can play. And so my first uh, question is sort of what business can do in the immediate term. So uh, sort of two parts of this. One is, um, you know, what can businesses do um, to just protect their own employees right now? So this is probably the you know, the hand washing and the social distancing, but maybe you can speak a little bit more uh, to what businesses can do just to protect their employees and customers at this at this time. Yeah, you know, I think Americans really have a growing appreciation for who our frontline people are when, when things go get rough in our communities. And so clearly it's not just our medical uh, staff, but it's also the people who are keeping the supply chains for food open and working the stores. Um, and so I think there are a number of things that employers are, are you know, can help to ease this burden on those people. The first thing I would say is pay them more. Um, you know, every day they're out there um, doing a tough job while the rest of us are in our houses. And so they should be compensated and they should be given healthcare and um, access to healthcare, affordable healthcare. Um, businesses should also be not putting pressure on their workers to come to work if they're sick. So not only is it for that individual's own welfare, um, it's to try and help reduce further spread. And so if you've got employees who are having to give up vacation time or personal time, um, if they feel unwell and make that decision, um, whether they come to work or not, you're pressuring them basically to, to come to work. And so when people are sick, they should be allowed to stay home and stay home without penalty. And then also in, you know, in work environments, you need to try and make sure as much as possible that you can have that physical distancing, that there's cleaning going on, um, and that there's good reporting. So when someone is sick, um, just like in a, in a community, a broader community, we can think about, well, who are those people's contacts? And so they're fully aware that they might have been exposed. 
Um, and the same thing for customers, you know, I've been quite heartened in the grocery stores and, you know, the places that people still occasionally have to turn up if they can't get online ordering happening, um, that, you know, there's been uh, some, you know, structuring going on in, inside these stores and taping out markings on the floor and really trying to help with, um, you know, community flow through those spaces to reduce the possibility of transmission and closing them at night. You keep hearing about that and cleaning them down very well to try and reduce virus transmission ac across surfaces from one day to the next mm -hmm. and offering opportunities for the elderly to come during certain periods and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I've been impressed with some of the things these local businesses have been doing, uh, at least here in State College, um, trying to make those environments safer for everybody. Is there maybe one thing that uh, you'd like to see change that maybe they could add or do differently? Just curious. Yeah, I think I'd like to see these um, employees being treated um, hmm. more like uh, we treat our doctors and nurses. I think they should be given a livable wage and access to health care. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So the other thing that businesses uh, can do besides protecting their employees is there's a lot of activity around businesses actually starting to engage their um, R&D people, you know, the 3D printing of masks and all this kind of, so I wanted to ask you your view of what do you find is maybe helpful in, in that? And I'm curious, maybe there's, I imagine with uh, people's sort of passion and the anxiety, frankly, around wanting to be a part of the solution, there might be some missteps that are also happening by entrepreneurs and businesses that are trying to do well, um, but maybe the ultimate results are maybe not so good. So what do you see that's being helped, that's, that's, that's helpful that businesses are doing? And, and maybe what do you see that's maybe not as helpful that could, could be adjusted? Yeah, I think I'm completely sympathetic to the notion of wanting to step up and help and, and being a bit frustrated. And, and also I'm really inspired by um, watching companies and, and also just you know across our university, watching different components of the university step up and try and be part of the solution. Um, and I guess I would just say, you know, to make sure that what you're doing is informed by, by good practice. And so, um, you know, initially when masks were being made and fabric masks were being made, I was saying, you know, um, to people who are calling me and saying, can we make masks for the doctors and nurses? And I said, well, you need to find out first whether they'll use them, <laughs> whether they feel like they're going to be efficacious, will they be safe? Um, and so, you know, don't make them a million sewn masks if they're not going to use them. I mean, ultimately, those sewn masks have become very helpful, I think, for the public. So um, the public is now using them. And they're also being used, I think, to cover over uh, medical grade masks that doctors and nurses are wearing. And so I think, you know, as companies are trying to figure out where they can step in and help, they need to make sure that they're communicating with the experts so that they know that they're helping in the right way and that their efforts are actually going to be useful. And so these, you know, these things need to be informed um, by good practice and scientific practice. You know, there's testing of masks to decide whether a mask works or not. Um, and so that's got to be taken into account. So I think that would be my advice is to, to consult, you know, check with the experts and, and make sure that what you're doing is ultimately going to help in the way that you think it is. Yeah. And the experts in that regard, if you're making, uh, you know, medical supplies, I guess would be the doctors and nurses actually on the front line who will be the beneficiaries of your creativity. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Um, that's great. Yeah. I teach that principle in my entrepreneurship class, right? You make yeah. sure that you're working closely with the people that uh, you hope to actually benefit, but sometimes um, uh, we do uh, human nature as we can get wrapped up in just kind of falling in love with our you know, product idea uh, and not the people who are to use it. So that's a great reminder of that. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, a couple of things about the kind of the longer term, you know, maybe uh, perspective of how businesses can be part of the solution to, you know, the next, uh, maybe avoiding you know, the next or reducing the spread of the next, um, you know, infectious disease. So this is a question about, it's maybe more supply chain focused, similar to your response earlier using, I think the Australia example uh, and the Hendra, uh, Hendra virus. So, and uh, your, your answer to that was, I think, you know, the need for maybe some government um, oversight regulation to kind of limit the, the uh, or protect, um, you know, natural areas and, and those kinds of things. So that may play a role in your answer here. But what, what can global companies do? There's a lot of attention being paid to sustainable supply chain management. And uh, that means a lot of different things. Um, so in general, I think it's a good time to think about sustainability and supply chains, more environmental and social responsibility and supply chains. Uh, in your perspective, working on infectious disease, what can companies do to somehow reduce or mitigate their environmental impact 
understanding now that that environmental impact can increase the probability uh, of the spillover of these kinds of viruses. Yeah, I think companies just need to be fully aware of the consequences of their actions. So, you know, and that's from the beginning of, you know, building locations to, you know, what sort of people am I employing and how far do they have to travel to come to work or how much water are we using or, you know, there'll be a whole range of factors from start to finish in setting up a business um, where your activities could have um, potential consequences that you're not aware of. Um, and so I think I would, I would just encourage people and I think we're all getting a really big lesson. <laughs> on this globally right now. And, and your point earlier was that we've raised sort of the disease and the consciousness of human society. And so I would like to think that we take from this that, that uh, lesson and keep that with us as we move forward. And so as we're thinking about um, our decisions and our choices around business, can we make sure that the impacts we're having are not going to lead to more of these sort of events? Are we going to, are we going to encourage these sort of events or, or can we be, um, conscious of our decisions and try and reduce those activities mm, that might yeah. lead to spread. Mm, that's a great answer. Yeah, and your, your answer makes me think about, uh, you know, what that might look like, you know, for companies to, uh, for example, you know, work with the scientists in the host country, right, or uh, nonprofit groups, NGOs, because companies uh, typically don't have this kind of expertise in-house. I think one of the things that's unique and that we teach about sustainability is that there's really a need to partner externally and find the expertise that, you know, uh, in, in this case, in the sciences, uh, in people that really understand the local, um, you know, sort of uh, literally the whole. Yeah. The local I mean, you know, environmental impact statements are something that people have had to do for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm not sure they've always captured this component of, mm -hmm. you know, what are the like, likely effects on, um, you know, local wildlife populations and could it lead to spillover? I just don't think that's been something that's been in the consciousness of those sort mm -hmm. of reports. And so I like your point of working with local experts or NGOs. You know, they might not be in the engineering company that you contract to do your environmental um, impact statement. Um, but, you know, it's, it's an extra source of information for companies if they want to do the right thing to try mm -hmm. to understand the local context, both mm -hmm. socially, but also in terms of biology. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think we I think I, there seems to be more of an awareness of understanding the local language, right, the local culture, to your point, right? local maybe uh, cultural standards, religious beliefs and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're gonna try to do something that's like healthcare you know, related and outreach in Haiti or uh, you know, Africa, those kinds of things. There's been a lot of missteps. I think we've learned things from that and the need for local partnerships. This seems like another opportunity to learn that and, and um, broaden our understanding of the kinds of you know, partners that we need. Um, so that's good. So that may connect actually to this last question, uh, last sort of business question that if we have time, we'll get to some of my student questions in rapid fire uh, succession after this. Um, so the other thing that businesses can do from a long-term perspective um, is in an area that we like to call kind of social entrepreneurship. There's a lot of, uh, uh, we like to think business-based solutions to environmental and social problems. And perhaps with regard to uh, combating infectious disease, the most obvious example would be Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation. I see he's all over the place now, yeah. uh, getting interviewed as kind of a proxy uh, uh, expert, if, if you will. Uh, so I guess, what do you think about this work? Not necessarily his, but you can certainly respond about, you know, to the Gates Foundation, their work, but just, uh, again, the good intention of social entrepreneurs. Uh, some of them are scientists, some of them are not scientists. Uh, they want to do something about, uh, in this case, infectious disease. Uh, you know, what do you think about it? What would kind of be your advice, you know, to them? Yeah, I think, you know, the Gates Foundation has done this really well. So hmm. trying to uh, put money at, at a problem, but also uh, respecting that um, they might not know the local context well enough. Hmm. And so, you know, when the Gates Foundation wants to work on an area, they bring in experts, they talk to local people, they... Um, they try to build long-term relationships with local communities and governments. So after they're done sort of seeding this effort, that they can step away and that it is sustainable and that you know, the work carries on. And so I think that's something that's really nice um, that the Gates Foundation has done. They also work across disciplines very well. So you know, they bring in social scientists, they bring in the, the regular scientists, they bring in sort of all manner of people that they think can help design the strategy so that they're most effective. And they've done this again and again in different areas. 
Mm. So again, it's that consulting with experts, getting mm. everyone involved that is appropriate, but then also really having strong local government and local community partners to make sure that you're not misfiring, that you're not offering something that's not appropriate or isn't going to work in that cultural context and offering something that is hopefully going to have longevity. So I think it's a, a beautiful model um, mm. as long mm. as people, um, you know, who want to try and replicate that really also replicate the way that the Gates Foundation operates in trying to have that breadth of knowledge and advice. Mm -hmm. That's great. Really good. Yeah. And do you see as somebody who's working on the science, what, what sort of, what, what do you think is the unique gap that a Gates Foundation or, or that kind of effort fills that didn't exist, I guess, before, right? So there's plenty of, I don't know if there's enough, right? But there seems to be a lot of science happening around uh, understanding these kinds of infectious uh, diseases at kind of the genetic level, let's let's say, uh, but there seems to be, and then there's a public public health component of that. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just curious to see how you could kind of describe what the the gap is, maybe that needs to be filled with a mm. business oriented or organizational solution. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a few things that they've done that, that are unique. One is really just the volume of uh, resources that they can put behind the effort. Okay, so, so I think that's one obvious thing. I think there are other, um, the other thing that's really important about their approach is that they often go after problems that um, others have sort of avoided, either because they're complicated or, or maybe they're not going to make anyone any money. And so they look to these sort of challenging issues and, and by bringing together experts from across disciplines, they have a greater opportunity to solve those than say other places, which are more narrowly focused on one aspect of that problem. So I think they really look at this integrated set of solutions across a complex problem. And they go after the problems that people, um, people are less interested in. So, um, you know, neglected tropical diseases, mm -hmm. things where, you know, if you developed a drug potentially, you might, you might not get a huge amount of return back from that. And so there are opportunities for them to help in a space where, um, you know, pure businesses alone might choose to not invest in those situations. And so they've got a real humanitarian bent on, on their approach. I think mm -hmm. that's what makes them special, as well as this really transdisciplinary integrated effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, okay, great. So this will be some people's favorite section. So I asked, <laughs> I asked some uh, Smeal College of Business students, some Penn State students, uh, what questions would you ask a expert in infectious disease if you had the opportunity? Uh, I, I took out any questions that were already answered in your excellent Ask Sid uh, YouTube channel, which we will be sure to point to uh, in, the, in the notes below. Uh, so we'll see if we can get to uh, get to all of these in kind of rapid fire here. Actually, there's not too many of them. So um, yes, this one is one that uh, I was wondering myself. There seems to be a lot of misunderstanding. So can you get COVID-19 again mm -hmm. after having it? Yes, yeah. yeah, so there were a couple of reports initially out of China where a few people claimed that they had had it a second time. It's not clear. There was only a couple of cases and they not, they've not really been properly explored. So it could be that you had a positive test, then you had a negative test, then you had a positive. It could be that middle test failed. And so it's not like you were actually cured. So the virus is there with the whole time. Or the virus dropped down to such a low level that it wasn't detectable or you didn't stab sort of the right part of the throat with the swab. Um, and so it just was like an example of a bit of a rebound. So I think until we do these large scale studies of serology, where we draw people's blood and we look at their, um, their immune reaction, their evidence of antibodies in response to the infection. We're not gonna have a really good idea yet of how long people are likely to be protected, whether that protection is gonna last for a month or two or three or a year after you've had this virus. And so I think it's still too early to, to call. If it is like other respiratory viruses like flu, we should have some level of immune protection. We also know that in macaques, um, we know that at least a month out, they are still um, producing antibodies and able to withstand a secondary infection and not get sick. Hmm. And is that forever or? Uh, so the study was finished in a month. And so we don't oh. know. And, and I, think, I think that's fine to finish that. And I think we need to really look in human populations because humans might be different than macaques. And so I think that as we're now getting data from human populations, we're going to get a good understanding of how long immunity is likely to last for people. Mm, okay, perfect. 
Uh, second question, is the transmissibility of COVID-19 affected by the weather? In other words, many state, and this is maybe another urban myth here, that it will be invariably slowed by warmer weather. Yeah, so we know that that happens for flu virus. So flu has this seasonality to it in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, in the tropics, not, it doesn't always have such clear, predictable oh. seasonality. Um, so what I think uh, people in the Northern Hemisphere are hoping is that when the warm events come, that we'll have some reduction in transmission. We don't know how much that's, that reduction might be. We know that these viruses that are transmitted in air droplets and can suspend in the air um, are transmitted better when the air is colder and drier. Um, and so winter is sort of a better time for them to hang in the air. Humidity and heat help to destroy the virus and have the droplets fall out of the air more quickly. Um, but we also know that other things happen in the fall, right? If we think about the cooler months, it's also when everybody comes back to school and university and you get all of these people spending time together. And so that can also increase the activity in the fall, not just weather. So I think because it's the new virus, totally new to the human population, we're gonna have to watch what happens here um, and how it rolls out across summer. We also have a lot of people who are susceptible. And so that might help to keep that transmission going through the summer. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, great answer. So that actually leads to kind of the next one. There's a lot of uh, articles out there. I've read one myself, a lar very long uh, feature length one about the different scenarios that we may see uh, here. Yeah. Um, so the question is, so, so some of the, you know, the, and what I'm referring to is some people think there's going to be this like slow release of the public out, you know, some people think there's going to be a release and then there may be several uh, kind of pulsings of, you know, sort of shutdowns. Um, and so I'm curious what, what's the, the truth or what's, what does the science say about that? Uh, and maybe another way to think about it is what are the factors that you have to consider, you know, yep. when, make, when making decisions about how restrictions are lifted? Yeah, so again, we're in new territory here, so I would say that. And that's probably why you see, you know, conflicting predictions. We're not completely sure what's going to happen. Um, part of the problem is that we don't have a really good handle on how many people are immune or have had the infection. So when we've got 20 to 50% of the population, depending on which study you look at, that is asymptomatic, it means that there are a lot of people who have potentially had the virus and we just don't know yet. Um, and then there are also a lot of people who've had symptoms but have not been able to get tests. And so, you know, if we were to guess right now what proportion of the population will be immune after that initial epidemic wave passes through, I think we're going to have a really hard time understanding what that would be. If we have a lot of immunity in the population, a lot of herd immunity is what we call it, um, then we might not see as much transmission as we start to let people back out of the houses. One place where we will potentially learn a bit is watching China. Right now, they're sort of relaxing their uh, social distancing rules and letting people back out of their houses. And that's a bit of a test model for whether we're going to see a big uh, spike as we let lots of susceptible people out and the virus might then have another wave. Um, and so I think we need to see what happens under those circumstances. So how much physical distancing we do, how long we're, we manage to keep that under control, how quickly that peak passes through our communities, how much immunity we have, um, all of these things are going to affect whether we get a little bit of transmission through the summer, also the weather, um, um, and that's the end of it, or whether we have a big spike again in the fall. I think there are a lot of potential scenarios. One thing could be that we just have to get used to living with this virus, and, um, and that might mean, you know, I think in China, they're starting to take people's temperatures as they come and go from buildings, you know, maybe permanently setting up spacing between tables at restaurants. You know, you could imagine changing the structure permanently of our grocery stores or our restaurants or our public spaces or where we go to, uh, mm. you know, concerts or whatever to try to, to reduce spread in a real ongoing way and yet still have some, um, you know, social and economic activity as well. And the last thing could be, you know, really... Um, trying to figure out who's most at risk and maybe keeping those people back in their households a bit longer um, as we start to let people back out again mm -hmm. to um, re-experience life. It's a bit of an experiment to be, to be quite honest. Yeah, very interesting. It's gonna be a very interesting time. Yeah. So uh, two other quick ones here. So uh, can you explain the science behind social distancing? So one of my students, uh, clearly we all know about the six feet but the question was, why six feet? What, what exactly does this mean? And, and where does the, what's the sort of the scientific 
rationale, I guess, behind that is what they were wondering. Yeah, so the distance, it relates to um, how, uh, if we think about the size of droplets being produced or particles being produced from people coughing or breathing, that's six feet. And now I'm hearing people saying longer, maybe eight feet is a bit safer, just trying to make sure. So um, sometimes viruses are spat out in really heavy particles that fall to the ground very quickly. Hmm. But if a virus is airborne, meaning it can stay in these very, you know, small, um, small pieces sort of out in the air for longer, then we need greater distances between us. And so this idea is to try and really cut down that potential for transmission. We know this virus is really good at transmitting itself from one person to another. And so this distancing, this physical distancing is really about trying to reduce that, that space. And so hopefully you're likely far enough away from someone that if they're talking or coughing or laughing and you know they're, they're expelling virus from the respiratory tract, it's not gonna get to you. Um, hmm. And the same so, reason why, you know, if you stay home, you're not exposing yourselves to physical surfaces where a virus might be. If you think about, you know, subways or public spaces where you could have a lot of contamination on surfaces. And we know that the virus can live for a few days on surfaces. So mm -hmm. by keeping the community at home, we're hopefully trying to break some of those transmission events uh, that would otherwise be happening. Hmm. Yes. And what is the laboratory approach to knowing whether it's six or eight or whatever? Is there something that's actually, you know, you take somebody who's infected and there's there something you're actually measuring or how is that determined? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of groups trying to understand this right now. So you could imagine doing it in a number of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, there is some evidence where I think um, they've sampled in the room where there have been sick patients and they're finding virus sort of, you know, up on surfaces and air vents. And, and so that's what's really started making people concerned only in recent weeks that it might actually be airborne. So it's not just necessarily, you know, a couple feet in front of a sick patient where those droplets are gonna fall to the ground. It's, it could be traveled over, traveling over much longer distances. Mm -hmm. So there's some evidence coming from patient rooms. There are also controlled studies being done where aerosols are being generated intentionally and they're looking at over physical space in a laboratory, how far does it travel? So you could do that. But you know, a controlled space like that is not the same as a human lung. Um, and so there are also animal models. So trying to look at mouse models and some other animals to try and understand not only how much is expelled in a more sort of natural circumstance, but also what does that mean for um, the animal on the receiving end, right? So looking at actual transmission between animals. Mm, okay, great. That's a great explanation. I think that'll be very helpful. It's certainly helpful for me. So l last question is kind of a fun one, although some of these myths are kind of dangerous, but I'm curious if you have like a favorite, um, uh, very unusual and maybe dangerously uh, ineffective uh, thing that you've heard about that people can do if to either avoid getting COVID-19 or if they have it to, uh, to cure themselves. So for example, I have heard about the efficacy of uh, in the last few weeks of deep breathing, uh, uh, hot, gargling hot water or something, I'm not sure exactly how that would work, uh, gargling Listerine. And literally a student told me whose father is a, uh, whose, do whose uh, dad is a, a, a doctor, said that uh, had a patient who apparently was breathing in bleach vapor and cured himself or herself. So. <laughs> Are there others you would add to that list or? Yeah, I think, um, I think I'm pretty protected from hearing those. I've had, um, I had the, um, the deep breathing thing come back to me through uh, someone in my family asking me if that was real or not. I'm pretty careful about the sources I read. Um, and so, you know, my advice to the public is that you should be careful too. Um, and so, you know, go to trusted websites, go to the CDC, go to the World Health Organization. These are healthcare professionals. They do not have an agenda. They're just interested in truth and making sure people stay healthy. And so there's no spin on what they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you exactly what's based on scientific evidence. Um, and, you know, you can imagine if you, if you see some of these false notions that are being spread and you act on them, you could put yourself in danger. So, you know, breathing in bleach fumes is not a good idea. Um, not only is it not a good idea, it doesn't work. And so I would caution the public to look very carefully at who your sources are. Do not believe all of this stuff that gets passed around on 
on Facebook and other social media sites, really spend the time to go to the World Health Organization, go to the CDC. If you see something that looks suspicious, go, go, go read about it, go find out. Chances are it's a hoax. And, and so, um, you know, do your part in not spreading those rumors, I would say as well, to other people. Try and shut down the transmission of the, of the crazy rumors. Mm, terrific, terrific. Uh, well, is there anything else uh, that has come to you that you want to uh, leave the public with uh, before we wrap up here, uh, Beth? Yeah, I would just say that I've been quite in inspired by a couple of things, really the public's interest in trying to wrap their head around this and learn the basics and the biology and the epidemiology, and also to do their part. So both um, you know, people in industry as well as people at home, I've just been really impressed with their commitment um, to making these really uncomfortable choices about how we're living right now for the greater good. And so I think you, know, you can get down about being stuck in your house and, and what this means for our daily lives, but I think you continually need to be uplifted by this sort of collective pause we're taking part in to, to uh, look out for others in our communities. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Beth. And uh, again, this has been a wonderful conversation with uh, Elizabeth McGraw, who's the director of Penn State Center for Infectious Disease uh, Dynamics.